Hi everyone and welcome back to Swans Cast. So um, we are joined today by a special guest. So we've got James here. Welcome, James. Cheers, mate. And and Lee has also uh, joined me once again. So welcome back, Lee. Hello. Um, and yeah, we're going to just get stuck into some some Swan stuff this week on perhaps on this roller coaster ride of the season, a little bit of a a, a down moment, if you like, this week. But um. James, obviously it's your first time on the podcast, so welcome, as I've already said. I know we can find you on Twitter at JamesSCFC underscore, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and you were telling me earlier you do a little bit of um, blogging about the Swans or, or interviews and stuff like that, so do you want to share with uh, with the audience some of your content and where they can find it? Yeah, so um, I do my own the independent website, obviously I'm trying to be a journalist in the future, so on my Twitter... Uh, on my pinned tweet, there'll be a link to one of my articles. And then if you go through that, this is my website that I run. I try to upload content as much as possible, not just on Swans, on different, as you know, my pinned tweets about uh, Derby County. I've got tweets on loads of different clubs like Sunderland and just basically just trying to make as much content as possible to create a little portfolio for myself for the future. Yeah, and uh, well done. Keep at it. Obviously, aspiring to be a journalist. So hopefully one day you'll be... Uh... You'll be somewhere good, and maybe you'll be asking us to come and give you hand instead. So, I hope so. Yeah, just, rem- <laughs> just remember us, yeah. Remember us. I will. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. So how how have you both been keeping then, Lee? How's this week been for you? Yeah, not too bad. I had a little week off work. First day back today, horrific. First day back, and then when you go back after after a break. But apart from that, it's been quiet. Watched football Saturday. All Six Nations, good sport weekend. Plenty of beer. <clears throat> yeah, it's been quiet apart from that. Six Nations on the weekend, yeah, like another another Welsh game where what could have been. Yeah, it played right to be fair. I know, I, 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 I thought know, we were gonna get smashed. Thought we were yeah, gonna get smashed. Right. And coming out of the last two games, I think we should have beaten England and perhaps could have beaten France. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, better than I was expecting to be fair. And uh, the England Island game was class as well. It was such a good game with the red card. I know. It just made me think how did we get stuffed by Ireland though? Yeah, yeah, like, I know. I know yeah. they're a good team, but they struggled against 14 man England, didn't they? Although England did turn up, I guess, after that yeah. incident. So it's it's always easy said and done. I can't really talk because we had 14 players like every game last year, and we didn't exactly, uh, yeah, I saw the ground running. And I saw a stat though that Ireland this year have had more minutes against 14 men than Wales did yeah, in the, I saw that in the as last well. six nations. Uh, maybe we can stop uh, having people shouting at us saying it was an easy, easy championship then. Um, yeah. James, been up too much this week? Uh, not really. I mean, I in college all the last week, working Friday and Sunday nights, and obviously watch the Swans on Saturday back in college this morning. Uh, yeah, apart from that, not a lot really, just back and forth with college and work, just trying to get through it. Yeah. That's fair enough. I know you feel um, I had a weekend off, but yeah, the. The work life is is always um always a bit of a slog isn't it but um yeah just i know, I know it's a little bit uh not the thing you want to be talking about but just come home from work and went to go and get some diesel and there's only one pump on in tesco's after queue for it and it was 165 and then after i actually got in luckily the woman came out and put cones behind me so don't know whether it was running out but the car that was queuing behind me was very happy bit of a situation we got at the moment i think um that was carnage I did see oh, somewhere that uh, the government apparently this week might announce a cut on the tax for fuel as an emergency measure. So I only filled half the tank, hoping next time would be cheaper. But um, maybe that was a bad move if there's nothing to fill it with. Yeah, so. yeah, that's true. On on another note, though, have you seen this thing going around with doors and wheels? Yeah, I just I thought when I first well, saw it, I was like, the TikTok oh. of it, didn't he? Yeah, I thought I saw it and I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. I'm never going to look at this, and I'm, I'm proper in now. And I saw it on James oh. Corden as well. Have you? Have you? Yeah. Oh, we've lost James. I'm sure you'll come <laughs> back now. Um, have you got an opinion on it? Or what, what do you think is the? Uh... I've gone back and forth. I didn't think I was going to get drawn in, but then I, I, I'm proper drawn in now. I've seen loads of videos and stuff, and I just What's keep going back on? and forth. Oh, there we are. He's back. <laughs> He's back. The, that technical is. difficulties. Why, uh, That's all right. <laughs> I was just about this to ask morning. you, are you team doors or team wheels? I thought you maybe rage quit oh, because... Um... Um... <laughs> <laughs> team wheels, mate. Team wheels. Yeah, wheels, I yeah. I'm wheels. No, I'm not wheels. Absolutely. I'm doors. I saw the I TikTok admin was uh, posting some doors propaganda and I wasn't happy. 
<laughs> well, I'm with, I'm with him on that. I think it's definitely doors. Are you two no, wheels as well? I don't. I yeah, I, I, yeah, I was wheels as of this morning because I saw like, you know, the conveyor belts they used to put luggage onto airplanes. It's all wheels. It's thousands of them. How many airports are there? Oh, I don't know. God. No yeah, idea. how many doors are in a skyscraper? Yeah, I know, but that's that's what yeah, I think. How many wheels are in one as well with all the little cabinets and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah but it's going to be in. more doors, isn't there? Probably, but then if you look at stuff like yeah, uh, and you'd like look at all your cupboards, your stuff. wardrobes, like yeah, toy cars, they all got doors on them. Yeah, but they they don't really count they because like especially like not all of them tiny ones. They're not doors because they they don't because like, isn't the have. definition of a door it opens up to something and they don't. Yeah, open. every drawer could yeah. be a technically a, a a door. Like no, yeah. But then if you look at like a chest of drawers, it's got like four wheels compared to the one door. Mine haven't got any wheels. I de- got... definitely wheels. Yeah, no. I'm definitely wheels. Definitely wheels. <laughs> I saw. Ask I saw me again next of, week. I saw a lot of statistics about how many houses are in the world and how many buildings are in the world, and it's definitely doors. I don't. I don't care what you say. It's. It's not. I don't care. <laughs> He's on his yeah, phone. Many... Years. I think he keeps uh, clicking the button. Yeah, but how many? How many cars are there? Yeah, but every car's got five doors on it or three doors. Yeah, but no, I suppose that's true. Yeah. So already balanced. That kind of sorts it out, mate. You're, okay, well, the cars over there, didn't you? No, well, the car, the cars are cancelled. I'm quite new to this, so you'll have to bear with me. The cars <laughs> cancelled out. You're having having some trouble with your phone there, you James. Yeah, I don't know what happened. There. Can we backstage? That's all right. That's all right. Um, if you do leave, I'll I'll drag you back in. So, uh, yeah, so... We'll, we'll 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 get on with it. Look, I'm not having this. Right, I'll kick you both out. It's doors, <laughs> and now we're moving on. Okay. Yeah. Just let us know in the comments, right. though, uh, what you all think. Is it doors or wheels? And um, tell us why. Don't just start shouting at me. It's wheels. <laughs> I want to know why it's wheels. And if you can't prove it. All right. Then... If you're bringing skyscrapers into it, though, every door that they've got, every meeting room has about 20 chairs with three or four wheels on yeah, it. Yeah, rolling, rolling wheels on it. What about a skyscraper that's not meeting rooms and it's just people living there? Yeah, but every like every like which, apartment, you're gonna have a door for your kitchen, the door for your uh, toilet, the door for your bedroom. All your kitchen cupboards will have doors no, on. Them. A lot like, of apartments only have three doors. Why are we still talking about this? The main, the main <laughs> door, of the toilet. Yeah, all your, win- all your windows are like technically doors, isn't it? I can go in and outside. No, you're, clutch, you're clutching the straws if you call you're it. You're clutching the straws. Yeah, conveyor you're belt. That's gears, mate. No, taking it too far. no the conveyor belt has wheels on it for the yeah. luggage to roll across you it. Don't it's want actual to bring wheels. Belt in. That's got loads of wheels. No, Cast- no, the casters. Even like inside of a car as well, the little wheels that turn inside of a car as well, it's just as well yeah. as the four. You yeah. can't have gears, mate. That's that's. If you're so having gears, I'm having windows and drawers. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> we'll pick it anyway, up again next um, week. Ten minutes into the podcast, and we will get on to the swans. Before we get there, just as always, don't forget to subscribe. I've noticed that about fifty-four percent of people are watching and subscribed. So please just click that big red button. It helps us grow as a channel. We really need to grow to try and uh, further what we do here. So we're aiming to get five hundred first, but the ultimate goal is to get to a thousand. So thanks to everyone who supported us so far, and. Yeah, we thank you anyone that's going to support us in advance as well. So uh, click the subscribe button and don't forget to like the video as well because that helps it go out to more people. And it will also allow James's uh, website to be seen by more people as well if the video gets more views. So let's support James in his journey to become a top Swans journalist in the future. <laughs> I'm not trying to guilt trip anyone there. <laughs> anyway, let's get straight on to the, the football then. So... This week, obviously, we came off the back of a drop in by Fulham. We visited Blackpool, an away game that I really wanted to go to, but wasn't able to, unfortunately. Um, but it did look like quite a few Swansea fans travelled up, and I think I saw pictures on Twitter of a lot of them in walkabout the night before, having a bit of a whale of a time. So it sounded like a really good away day. Got to miss that one, but um, glad for those that did go up and enjoyed. I'm glad they enjoyed the night before because I'm not sure they would have necessarily enjoyed the 90 minutes of football the day after. But, I mean, Blackpool Pleasure Beach isn't too far away, so you could always just go and ride some some actual roller coasters instead of having to sit through one this season. Um, the one goal come in, what was it, like the fourth minute or something ridiculous? I think it was the eighth or ninth, wasn't it? Eighth, eighth minute, okay. From, from a corner, basically, where 
Gary Medine was um, just left at the back post, unmarked. I did notice one of the Blackpool players basically was hugging Mac Grimes and Cyrus Christie, which, I mean, you could argue the ref should blow up, but then at the same time, you could argue why are they just allowing him to hold hold them and not trying to break free and do more about it? Um, regardless, it was the recipe for another poor away performance. And I just want to ask the question, what is going wrong for us on the road? So, James, as a guest, do you want to kick us off with this one? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it with away trips is confidence. You know, you've got to be a really confident side to go to certain places. Obviously, there's certain there's really hard grounds to go to in this division. You know, Blackpool obviously including that. They've got good home fans. And obviously, with the new system, you know, it's still developing, still adapting. I think confidence probably isn't as high as it could be. And especially, you know, you come off a 5-1 loss in the week. That's not going to help any form of the confidence either. So I think it will come. I just think with the process, I think with the confidence increasing and increasing and the results will also increase away. You know, we saw that stat from uh, Guto saying, was it we haven't won uh, on a Saturday away for a whole calendar year and we've only taken three points out of a possible 33 on Saturdays away from home this season. So obviously not great. And, you know, the coaching staff, no no fan wants to go 2,000 miles or whatever. It's so stupid to go see their team lose 1-0, 3-0, 2-0, whatever. But I think it'll come. It'll just take time. Yeah. Got anything to add there, Lee? I know you watched the game, so maybe you've uh, got some insight for us there as well. I think you're on mute. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> Classic. I think, yeah, Saturday would have been a bad time to talk about it because I was so frustrated after the game. But um, I, I didn't actually realise, well, I did, but I didn't really think about it, how young our squad actually is. didn't realise Joel Perot was only 22. I thought he was older I than that. told you that before. Yeah, he's I know. Younger it just than Liam really, Cullen. I know, it just hasn't sunk in because it just doesn't seem like he's 22. No, it's just like Downs as well. Yeah, you know, Downs is only like 22, 23. And I think Obafemi's 21. Yeah. But I don't know. It just seems like these players... And Cabango's only 20. I think he's or 21. Yeah, he's just really think, like, young considering how long he's been playing. I just... Yeah, it seems like these players have been around for, for ages. Sure but well. if you think about it, they are still... They are still very young. So I think, like, in these sort of situations, especially what, what keeps happening is if we sort of... It tends to be the trend that if we go 1-0 down away from home, we struggle to get back into the game. And that's probably just an experience thing. Because it seems like teams just sit back, don't they, and just let us have the ball. And that's what it was on Saturday. It was just, it was literally 80 minutes of us with the ball and one shot on target. It was, it was frustrating to watch. But yeah, I, I, I will give them a bit of credit there because I think I was surprised at how young the squad was when I actually looked at it. It's far, far more reserved than the way you were talking to me on Saturday. <laughs> I'm trying to be calm. I'm trying to, trying to find a good, because the last couple of times I've come on, I've been quite nuclear. But, I just thought oh, I'll have to calm it down a bit. That's fine. But it was, to be calm, fair, so though, you can be the other extreme, and then it's a good on, balance. <laughs> on the on the face of it, though, that that amount of possession in any game, home or away, you've got you've got to have more than one shot on target. It's just you, you've got to create more than that. Even if, and I said to you before, even if I, I can always say about Russell Martin's game management, they're one nil down. It's they've they've had the ball for you know seventy minutes. Maybe try something different. You know, it's a league game. So, well, maybe not so much. Maybe sort of sacrificed a bit this year because he keeps saying, you know, I can't wait to see us next year and all this. So maybe he's still just trying to be a bit stubborn with his system. But you want to see, like, you know, a league game, you're losing 1-0. Maybe chuck some extra forwards on. Maybe just chuck people forward. You know, I did, you know I'm did. you no manager, but if you're 1-0 down... To be fair, I'm going to call you up a little bit. Forward. A little bit. Not the fact that he's changed his in-game management, but you were saying about changing things, yeah. Yeah, he did play four at the back, which he did against Fulham as well, which is something different to most of the season. So he kind of is trying something forced or otherwise doesn't matter. Yeah, he I is trying that. something different. I think it's forced through injury when Wolf was injured. Yeah, maybe it is, but the only reason we started playing five at the back in the first place under Steve Cooper was because it was forced by injury. Yeah. But then everyone gave him credit that it was a system that really worked for us afterwards. I think it challenge you both on the sense of um, with a transition season as well, that you've got to try and stick to what you're trying to get to as much as possible because if you change it constantly, you know, you don't have 90 minutes, 90 minutes, 90 minutes of playing the same football. I know it's frustrating now, but yeah. I think if we sacrifice results this season for a long-term gain of sustainable results next season, I think 
sticking with it, even when we're not necessarily doing the best. Obviously, you know, don't bring on defenders when we're losing 3 0, but yeah. at the same time, try and keep it as close to your long term yeah. aim as possible so then it'll stick with the team next season. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. I think he doesn't do it for that reason. I think, I think, like, yeah, yeah, it's easy, it's easy for us to sort of cry out for him to change it in the moment when we're 1-0 down. But I think he doesn't do it for that exact reason. I think he's just getting the game time with that system and the young players in there. So the more game time they have with that system. So I think that's why he doesn't do it. But it is frustrating sometimes. Um, I, I do agree with you in a way that sometimes you do need to change it during a match. Though We, we called him out on that in the last video, I think, um, a little bit. So that is, that is uh, maybe something. But at the same time, I did say as well, a lot of historic Swans managers who play passing football have always been the same. They won't change it. They'll stick to the passing routes and and they will work is this way or, or no way. And kind of, it seems to be a theme with this style of football, at least for us, as well as the thing you mentioned earlier, which is going behind and struggling to come back into the games. I feel like that's always been a theme of us playing this style of football as well. Uh, because like you said, teams just sit back, there you have the ball. And it's up to you to try and break them down then. And when you're just kind of passing around them, it's probably a bit easier to defend than if you're lumping a, bo- a ball into the box all the time, which I'm not asking for, but it's a different challenge, isn't it? So, um, yeah, anything yeah. interesting from this specific game that you've picked out? One thing I noticed was, um, because I went on a Blackpool podcast before the game, and they were praising Josh Bowler, saying how good he is and how good form he's been in. And it looks like he had a bit of a quiet game. And they were they were like loving it because I told them our left back was basically unavailable and they were going to be playing against Corey Smith, but it doesn't look like he did much. He, yeah. Well, he, yeah. he should have buried two chances or Yeah, that was he, Yeah, he had one just before half time. He's one on one with Fisher and it's it wide. He's got to score that one. And then there's one later on in the second half where he kind of drags it drags it wide and he probably should score. But he was, he, well, yeah, well, I think like most of the Blackpool players are quiet just because of the amount of ball we had, but he definitely should have scored two goals. I think I'd praise Corey Smith, though, because I know he was filling in, but as you said, yeah. you know, this bowler has been targeted by these top teams in the championship, and all of a sudden he's dropping under six ratings because Corey Smith, you know, on that yeah. side, keeping him quiet. And I think, you know, he's been heavily criticised all season, me included, you know, I haven't been afraid to say what I feel about Corey Smith in midfield, but at the same time, he has been playing number 10, which isn't his role at all, but I said on Twitter, I think it was, he's been the midfielder of the season that's played brilliant everywhere but midfield. You know, you put yeah. him right back, left back, and he's been fantastic, <clears throat> I think. Yeah, he's true. In. I don't think he's had a bad game at full back as well. No, he's been right there. Yeah. I just think is the issues he has is he's not an attacking player. So when he's playing in the attacking role, we criticise him because he's not really creating much. But that's not yeah, what he does. That's not what he's there for. Yeah, and that's yeah. why he struggles there. He does a good job otherwise, like, keeping the ball, passing it around, defending. But when he's in that role, that's not what you're asking him necessarily to do all the time. And we don't we don't create so much and that's why he's, he's, he gets a bit of criticism. But maybe it's not his fault, is it? And he's doing he's he's doing the job he's asked quite often in a different position. So uh you know credit to him for being so versatile this season. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm not sure he, he seems like the sort of player that if we do get a few more signings in might be one of the ones on the the next lot of players that might end up going, perhaps just because he's getting shifted around so much, he's not cementing a, a, a first team role in his favoured position. So if we get a proper left back in, get cover a right back, you know, get more attacking players in, maybe we end up with another centre midfielder in the long term, you know, one or two more transfer windows. Maybe then his days will be numbered, but he is getting a bit older as, as well, isn't he? So um, we'll see. I'm just speculating. Um, the other thing I picked up on, I mentioned Josh Bowler perhaps didn't have the best game. Joel Perot as well. And I just want to touch on this, not just from this game. Obviously, since we've been fitting in Michael Oberfermi, he's dropped behind. He's in a more deeper position. And it, it has worked on occasions, and he's picked up a couple of goals, but he's definitely getting less chances. He's, and for me... He's definitely involved in the games less. And for our top goal scorer, I know we want to fit in over Fami because he's been playing well. But are we sacrificing too much in what Perot offers just to get them both on the pitch? Because I feel like we're not getting the best out of Perot now. Uh, he's not looking like 
if he was from now to the end of the season, out of those two, it doesn't look like Perot would be the top goal scorer for me. Just because of the chances he's not getting as many, he's not in those positions as much. I'm just asking the question, like, is it worth it for us? Or are we forced into it because of our lack of attacking players at the moment? But in the long term, at least in the way they play with one behind the other, is that the right way forward? What do you think, James? Um, it's actually hard to say because obviously Perot was on fire at the start of the season, being the only striker, he got all the ball, he got all the chances, and then obviously Obafemi comes in and all of a sudden it's half and half and you know, if one of them misses a chance, you know, that's half a chance that maybe the other striker could have got. But I think with uh, with Obafemi as well, obviously, you know, we had the whole situation, whatever was going on behind the scenes with him and, you know, Perot was getting constant game time. But I think with Joel, it's hard to tell, obviously, you know, because he, 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 has, he, has, he has slowed down since Obafemi's come in. But then, obviously, the counter-argument is if we bench Obafemi all the time, does he then get unhappy or is his progress halted? As a striker, so you know, it's two brilliant young strikers, both very, very talented yeah. young strikers. And I think there's obviously got to be a fine balance in between both of them because you've got to, they're, they're two young strikers, you've got to develop them, they've got to be playing every week to develop into great players. Yeah, what do you think, Lee? Yeah, yeah I agree with it. We're in a really, we're in a blessed position, really, to have both of them to try and fit them both in. Um, I think they're quite different strikers as well, and I think Obafemi likes to be sort of classic nine, try and get him behind with a bit of pace. And Perot, even when he plays up front, naturally drops a little bit deeper, doesn't he, to sort of get get into the game. So I think it does work at the moment. I think he's played well though when he's dropped back in the midfield. You even see him like putting his foot in and making some tackles, and and he's quite clever as well. Perot, he does create, I think. Um, but yeah, I get what you're saying. I think. He's such a good finisher, like we've seen like this season when he gets a chance, and then nine times out of ten he's burying it. So it just could be something again that he's that he's trying. Um looking looking towards next year, seeing where he can fit them in. Maybe he'll try something different between now and the end of the season. Or he's just dropped him back a little bit to stop him scoring some goals so he doesn't score in the summer. Yeah, I imagine <laughs> that was the reason. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't start on both. Perhaps it is what we need to be doing, but I would like to see maybe something else sometimes we've got on cham playing perhaps wide and i'm not sure that's the best place for him is, is it not an option perhaps with Oberfemi's pace to put him out there keep joel perot kind of as a striker and put cham behind perot play him as more of a a cam role one thing i'd think... say about Nicham is he's been i don't know from like a, anyone else's perspective whether he's been way more effective when he comes off the bench to make an impact rather than starting i think you look at his contributions in recent games They've all come from off the bench rather than. I'm sure Lee will agree with you here. He's not been a massive fan of him of late. Yeah. No, I haven't, to be fair. But he's, he's obviously you know, a great player. You know, he's got a very high pedigree of high level football. But again, he was great at the start of the season. I think he's been much better coming off the bench. You know, his fitness was obviously mentioned when he joined, and you can tell he's not yeah. built to last 90 minutes every match. Yeah. I think it's obviously with, you said, with both of the strikers playing, it's just a case of obviously creativity you know are we going to benefit with more creativity with two strikers or one and whichever one's the answer you really need to adopt that as soon as possible because yeah that is our main issue is creating stuff in the final third yeah well yeah go on Lee. No, i think uh, no, i was just gonna go yeah i just i have criticized him quite a lot recently um but i did caveat it and say that i don't think he's fit i definitely don't think he's been fit all season You've, we've seen glimpses of like what he can do, but not not enough for me. It's just games like Saturday where you know he's got the quality and you just, when we're sort of struggling up against, you just don't see him. You just don't see him really making a contribution. Um, but no doubt, like if they can get him fit and, you know, uh, well, 100% fit, I think he'll be class going into next season. Where you play him, I'm not quite sure because, I don't know, I used to think he was a 10, but then when he comes on and plays sort of in a wider position. Like when he came on against West Brom and that run down the wing and got that assist for the the, uh, the pro goal, that was class. So I don't know. Maybe I'm not really sure where he fits in at the moment. So watch the space on that one. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Especially with the two forward. up front, you know, where, but yeah, like where he fits in. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. Um, looking at the performance on the whole then, Russell Martin's actually come in for a bit of stick for his comments he made after the game. So, you know, 
if you look on it on paper, we've conceded after eight minutes, come one nil down. You can even look at the momentum chart for after the game. And it is very much all of us in regards to having the ball. But, you know, the chart shows the depth and the bigger your bar is, like the more attacking threats supposedly you're having. It doesn't look like we offered much from the stats, if you like. I know, Lee, you watched the game and you say and it was quite boring, really. But Russell Martin has come out and said that he's happy with the performance and we dominated the game after the goal. He did say he was frustrated with the way we conceded so early and it was a poor goal to concede, and he did say that. And he also did say um, that we didn't make enough chances up front. But then he's saying he's happy that we were dominating and the dominant performance away from home. Now, I'm sure you'll have your say on it. I'll just say what I think about it first. I think the headline makes the comments look a lot worse. When when you read the headline, Russell Martin says, happy with dominant performance. And you see in the 1-0 loss where you haven't even had hardly any shots on target, everyone starts kicking off. When you actually look at the full thing of what he said, I do get what he's trying to say. You're like, yeah, he's annoyed with the goal. He's annoyed we didn't make more chances. But when you compare against perhaps against the games like Sheffield United away, Stoke away, where we just got battered, really, um, you know, at least this time, as much as it was still a bad result and we want more, at least this time we kind of managed the game by having the ball. Now, it's easy to say, like you said earlier, oh, yeah, you can just kick the ball around all day, keep the ball. If the other team's sitting in and they're going to get a 1-0, you know, obviously happy days for them. And, yeah, okay, fair enough. We need to do more going forward. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if the comments deserve as much outrage as they got, but I do get where it's coming from at the same time. So leave us your take on that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's it's in context, isn't it? Because when you watch when I when we watched the game it was um you know well it wasn't great. We had all the ball but we didn't we create anything. So I think it was just the frustration. So when he comes out and says something like that, I think it's just a bit of an initial sort of hit back on the on the back. You know what it's like if if we did a podcast on a Saturday after the game, we'd probably say way ridiculous things that we regret. Um, and I think that's what it was. I think it's just a bit of a backlash, maybe a bit of frustration, because it's not the first time it's happened all season. So I think it was that. Because I, I, like I said to you Saturday, I was like, oh my God, his comments. And I went a bit mad. But now that I've actually read what he said, what he's saying is we do, we did dominate the game in terms of possession. And I think going back on like what James said earlier, he just, that's what he wants. He probably thinks like if we can do that nine times out of 10 on the road, going forward, we'll probably win the game. So I think looking forward to next mm. season, if we have 70% possession on the road, they will, they, will, they will create chances in the future. So I think that's what he's getting at. But it, yeah, sometimes it's just frustrating to watch that for 80-odd minutes. Yeah, have got anything to add there, James? Um, yeah, obviously yeah, it is frustrating. And, you know, it's not going to be the most pleasant watching us just pass around the back for 80 minutes, one nil down. But I said, you know, it is harder... I think if you look into the game, it was just the fact of one early mistake from the defence and then, yeah. you know, Black will go 11 behind the ball for the rest of the game and it becomes incredibly yeah. hard to break a team like that down, especially when they're at home. You know, they got the home fans behind them. They're going to want to defend for their lives. You know, they're trying, obviously, I'm not saying they will, but they're only about six points off the top six as well. So yeah. more results come their way. You know, games like that against us are massive for them and they're going to put everything into trying to hold that lead. So I think... We didn't create a lot, no, but I think they made it really difficult for us. So they got to be credit for Blackpool in that sense. Yeah. yeah, it was their game plan as well. The manager came out afterwards and said, like, teams need to put their ego behind uh, when they're playing against the Swans because you've got to do the dirty work, get the goal, and then kind of just graft for the rest of the match and just defend it. It's kind of what you were saying. Um, so I think he knew exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to go 1-0 up and anyone interested in really more. If you get more, fair enough, bonus, but yeah, they they done the job and that was it then. Now we got something to defend and that's the way they approached it and obviously it worked. We know we need more attacking um, reinforcements really and creativity and a little bit more up front. And I guess, like you said, Lee, for Martin, it's like if we get the basics right in terms of the style and what we're building our game around, when we get those players in or improve over time, the players get a bit older, that attack will eventually come and we will do more up that end so i think he's looking at the bigger picture when he makes those comments but i do get why 
after the game it's like what you want about we just lost one nil and didn't even look like a sniffer scoring and i do get that as well so maybe he needs to kind of understand that side of the fans thinking as well when he's in press conferences because he just he just want to come across as not really understanding what people are thinking does he but i guess um in overall he means good intentions i think and he's looking at the long-term vision which yeah. is something i think we all should be happy with that the manager is looking at long term because i'd be worried if it was if it wasn't that way because you know it might not be the the case that we keep him for that long maybe get sacked maybe a club comes in as often happens but you don't want the manager hoping a club comes in in the summer so uh yeah i mean yeah it and yeah so badly. yeah like like you say, emotions run high after the game. I mean, if you look at the big picture, I mean, the what, what he's done, like transforming the way we've played in, what is it, like six, seven months, eight months maybe, with a makeshift squad. He come in like three days before the season started, no pre-season, still got to go back to that. Um, yeah, I think no doubt it'll be 100 times better next season. But to even just have like the possession stats that we do and managers coming out and saying that they've got to adapt the way that they play against us is already... Big signs, isn't it? But having said that, he's put a lot of pressure on himself for next season because he said it a lot now. He comes out and says, like, I think he said on Saturdays, like, I can't wait to see us next year. Yeah, like, so this is what I was going to touch on next is yeah. he came out and said, I'd love to see us in a year's time. But he kind of said it the other day as well. And he keeps maintaining that it's, you know, in a year's time, this is, it's just going to work a lot better. We're going to be a lot better. And it did work for him at MK Dons. And that was the case. And they were class in a year's time. But, yeah, if it's not the case uh, in a year's time, then he's going to be in trouble. So, I, again, maybe you don't shout about that so much. I know why he's doing it, of course. He's 100% confident in his system and what's happening and the way we're going. And, and you've got to be as a manager. But, again, it's, yeah. it's one of those things where you kind of got to put your money where your mouth is now because you don't want your comments to come back and kind of bite you. So he's... Maybe made life difficult for himself, but then if it works, then you're going to look back on this and be like, fair enough, he was right and he was backing himself and he, he got it done. It's just if it's the opposite, yeah. that's where yeah. um, it might not be the most pleasant uh, period and I think, ending. I think it's fair because the signs are there, isn't it? I mean, some games this season we've been outstanding. You've seen like some of the passing football we've played. It doesn't always work in some games like on Saturday, but the signs are there that you know, he's on to something. So being optimistic. Yeah. Um, so this next uh, conversation then is one that I think James will enjoy. But um, there's, there's a couple of players in the squad that perhaps should have moved on by now. Um, maybe we're surprised they have moved on. Maybe we couldn't shift them. Whatever the reason is, they're still here, still featuring uh, now and again. I think... Two different situations, though. One of them in and out of the team. More in the team at the start of the season has fallen out in recent weeks. The other one kind of, like, don't even know what's going on in and out of the team randomly. But that's Fulton and Bennett. So, looking at the Blackpool game, Fulton was on the bench, didn't come on. Yet, there was a debut for another midfield player we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. And Bennett didn't even make the bench this time. We've got Finley Burns on loan from Man City. People are questioning that signing, but then he's getting on the bench ahead of Bennett at the moment. So, you know, uh, people have been unhappy with Bennett this season. So I guess if if uh, if he's not on the bench, perhaps people will be happy with the fact that someone else is there instead of him. But where are these two players now in a Swans career and what is the future for them? So my opinion is that... Um, both of them probably don't have a future at the club. I think it's quite clear that that's going to be the case. Uh, Bennett, I think, is more... He's probably getting close to retirement age. He's probably slowing down quite a bit now, and he's had a decent career. He was really good for us last year. I think he really doesn't suit the system this year, and I think that's been quite clear. He was a experienced head maybe in the early part of the season, but now as the system gets more developed... It's just more and more clear that he's not necessarily suiting the system. Uh, as for Fulton, I feel a little bit um, more divided on this one. I still think he's got something to offer. Um, he played really well under Graham Potter doing a similar sort of football. 
and then obviously Steve Cooper probably suited him a lot more. I think I think maybe the red card he had at the start of the season went against him and he struggled to force his way back into the plans. But I feel like another championship club could pick him up quite easy and he'd probably have a good career there. But um, James, I know you maybe have a little bit different opinion on at least one of the players. So would you like to share your thoughts? Um, yeah, as you say with Bennett, you know, he's getting to that age now where he's probably on the tail end of his career. He's not really in his prime years anymore. And again, you can't discredit what well, they played like under Cooper. You know, he was a solid centre-back in that system. But I just think there's certain players who just aren't built passing football. And I think Bennett is one of them. He's built for that sort of like, you know, brick defence who just yeah. hold on for all costs. And I think that's not what Martin's trying to do. So I think obviously, you know, if he doesn't fit the system, he doesn't fit the system, you know, he's going to be moved on. And obviously... Being our highest earner and not even making the bench, you'd have to say that probably is another incentive to try and get him to move on because, you know, you don't want to be paying someone, was it, £23,000 a week if they're not even going to make the match day squad. You know, it's not when, you know, that money could go to someone who's going to start for us every week. So, yeah, you know, with, with Ben, I think his time is up with us now, obviously. I think he'd probably agree if you told him that as well. I think he's ready to move on somewhere else. And as far as fault then... Again, you know, you can't discredit how amazing he was under Steve Cooper. You know, he was brilliant all season long. You know, you can't fault him half the time. You know, perfect for the system. But again, you know, he said he showed glimpses of it and the potter as well. He can play in the passing system. I think when you've got players like Matt Grimes, Flynn Downs in that midfield, it's so hard to get in under them. Like, you know, I don't really, I know it's a bit controversial, but there's not many better midfield duos than them two in that, in that position, I don't think, in the league. You know, they're so both talented footballers that when you've got them to compete with it's obviously going to be a challenge and I think Fulton's career is by no means over and he's a brilliant footballer I just think he works better in again a more Steve Cooper like system where he's just you know you could tell he loves a good he loves getting stuck in you know so does Downs as well but Downs has got a little bit more uh, like composure aspect to his game a bit more better with the passing and I think for Fulton you know he could be a good squad player but as you said you know certain people making their debuts on Saturday, rather than bringing on Fulton, probably says a lot about where he stands in the team right now. Yeah, I think um, Russell Martin made up his mind on on him from day one. I think, to be honest, so I don't really, I don't necessarily think he's given him the best, most fair chance of actually proving he can play in this system. Uh, but there, you don't really know what happens in training. But managers come in with their own ideas, don't they? So it is what it is there. But. Uh, yeah, a little bit more reserved than what I expected after the uh, the Fulham game the other day, but maybe you've had a chance yeah. to calm down. But... Yeah, emotion. Uh, you know, it's just any fan, you know, you care so much about the team, you see them lose, you get massive oh, yeah. frustrated, and you say so many things after the game that you yeah. don't actually mean. Oh, you know, it's, it's, you know, no, I understand, yeah. It's, uh, some, of the, some, of the stuff, some of the stuff that I messaged Luke after games was ridiculous. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to calm him down, and he's like, no, you're not listening to me. The comments <laughs> like, on Twitter as well, you know, I... I, I we want to say it as well, you know, people who don't think Martin's the right manager does a bit and does annoy me a bit, I'm not going to lie, because, yeah. you know, you've got to just understand what's going on at the minute and you've got to realise that this isn't, this was never going to be a short-term project, it wasn't going to yeah. be, you know, like Cooper, obviously, you know, you can't compare them, so yes, he got us results, yes, we got playoffs two years in a row, but at the same time, that football isn't sustainable to continue with in the long term and it won't work forever, you know. As you said, you know, you play against teams like Blackpool the way they played on Saturday. That won't work forever if they keep playing like no. that. And I think people just got to realise it will come. You've just got to be patient with Russ and hopefully the yeah. clubs and, and they well, asked for it as well. Most of them asked for it in the summer. They got fed up with Cooper yeah. and wanted yeah. more like <laughs> exciting past the football. Maybe it wasn't as exciting as you want on the weekend, but you've got to build that. You're not just entitled to it overnight and it's got to yeah, come from exactly. somewhere. Yeah, the thing so, is, when we did it, when people say about going back to the way we used to play before, it took years, you know. When Martinez took us over in League One, that's kind of where it started. It took years before we were, you know, really hit our stride playing that football. So it's not just going to happen overnight. And we said about the time that he had at the start of the season. It's just one of, like we said, after the game, you're like, oh, it's ridiculous and all this. And um, But then once you once you have, have a calm down, you uh, you see the longer picture. I've, ne- I, I, I've never gotten to the point where... I don't think Martin is the right man, though. I think he, I think he's been brilliant. Yeah, you could, yeah. Like I said, you could still see the signs of what he's implemented already. So, with a full preseason and maybe some more faces coming in and out, I'm uh, I'm excited for next season. It was also a lot easier to find a bargain back then as well in terms of someone. Oh yeah, 
play yeah. this sort of football that nobody knows about. Like everyone's got top notch scouting networks this, these days, and the money in football is just crazy, and people just don't have the the cash to stump up quite often yeah. these days. So it's a different environment to try and build build your team in at the moment, unfortunately, and COVID hasn't helped. So you've got to get a bit of context and have a bit of patience. And I think sometimes, you know, the best things come to those who wait. Like Daniel Farker and Norwich, he, he didn't, it didn't. It took him a bit of time to get going, didn't he? He had a bit of a bad season, I think, the first one. But just an example that's come up top of my head. But um, well, yeah, if you look at um, if you look at West Brom as well, like they obviously put Ishmael in there, didn't they, to sort of change the way that they play, and they had jumped the gun and got rid of him. And now look, they're not in a better position now, are they? They brought Steve Bruce in, so you've got to be careful yeah. what you wish for sometimes. So who do you want to come in if if you sack Russell now? Yeah. Uh, like if you look in the West Brom as the example, they sacked a project manager and got Steve Bruce in as one of the like, oh, he's done it, he's been and done it, you'll you'll do a good job, get us to the playoffs, and they had an absolute torrid start under him. So uh, you know, you could sack Russell Martin now and then it gets worse. You'd end up with someone yeah. like Mark Hughes or Tony Pulis and it would just oh, all go God, down yeah. the drain. <laughs> you'll start again then as well, new. Yeah, and then you're back to the unsustainable short term gain for no yeah, long term yeah. benefit. I think yeah. if you oh, commit to a manager you know, like him at the start of the season, yeah, for a project, then you need to allow him time to build the project. A project isn't seven, eight months into a season. You know, we're not at risk of relegation, so it's kind of a bit of a free pass now. We're we're not going to yeah. go down. We're like what twenty points clear. Something. I, think. I mean, even if we weren't, the teams 19. in the bottom four were so poor. I would yeah, yeah, best. they are. Yeah, but like, well, there's only ten games left or nine games left, is there? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, we are surprised. Playing. Yeah, we're on forty-four and Barnsley are on twenty-four, I think. So yeah, we're pretty far away from that threat. Yeah, yeah so I, I, they're not. I don't think any of the bottom three teams again to our points total. Forty-four. <laughs> yeah. uh, Barnsley on twenty-five now. Yeah, so they, they're not getting another nineteen points, are they? They've got twenty-five from thirty-six, and they didn't <laughs> even have a points deduction. <laughs> Yeah, that's so, bad, um, isn't it? Barnsley and been quite bad this season. I mean, I know I don't want to say too much because we've got Peterborough next now. Watch them go turn us <laughs> over. But um, Barnsley's yeah, form has, has improved <laughs> recently, to be fair to them. <coughs> there we are, Lee. Lee's got uh, oh, the role. Sorry, I thought I muted myself then. <laughs> <laughs> to cry. I'm sure everyone, if you've got a plane in the car there, just had like a massive uh, um, impulse from your speakers. Oh, Wake them up while they're driving them <laughs> from work. There we are. <laughs> Anyway, let's move on. We did touch on um, debuts for a couple of players. So finally, we got to see our new left back in action. Nathaniel looked better, got off the bench, replacing Corey Smith, played about 30 minutes of football. What are your first impressions on him, Lee? Yeah, to be fair, not didn't have a great deal to do. Looked sharp, to be fair. Seemed to settle into passing the ball around. He had a bit of a good interplay on the, on the wing with Patterson at one point, which created our one shot on target. Um, but apart from that, it's, um, yeah, you can't, can't really judge too much. I think he played again today, didn't he, in the under-23s. I think he had to run out again. Yeah. Um, so I think he de- desperately needs game time. I don't think he'll start again. I don't think he'll start on Wednesday either. I think he'll come off the bench again. Because um, I think he's been out for ages, isn't he? Was, wasn't he out a bit before he even came to us? Yeah. He was injured. So I think, before, with yeah, I think. Yeah, I think. first training session with us, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so I think he's just uh, he's just easing him in. I think he said, I win one interview, Martin. I think he said um, it's unfair for me to like chuck him in at the moment. So I just I don't think he's quite ready yet. But it seemed all right what I saw for the thirty minutes. So watch his space on that one. Yeah, you excited about him, James? So yeah, you know, it's, again another young player. You know, you can see the philosophy of Mark's trying to do with you know revamping the squad from a bit of an aging squad back down to what we. Usually go with the younger squad, you know, 20 years of age. Still not, you know, not experienced at this level yet. So, you know, to be thrown in straight away after an injury is not going to be easy, especially on your first ever game in this level. So, I think, yeah, he, he, look, he look good. You know, showed some glimpses of things. Obviously, not a lot you can do in half an hour of the football when you're chasing the game as a defender. But, yeah, he looked good. I think he could be a good player. And um, 18-year-old academy project, uh product this it should say not project cameron concrete got on the pitch as well um i think you only had like nine minutes or something but another one off the academy line uh the latest one perhaps one that 
wasn't expected at the start of the season. I think he's come on quite well under Russell Martin by all accounts. So um, nice to see someone else getting getting an opportunity. So maybe <clears throat> one for the future. But from the glimpse you saw of him, Lee, you got anything uh, to offer us? A little bit of insight? Well, I don't know. It's him again. He was um, didn't have a lot to do in that sort of short time that he came on. He looked like he had a nice little first touch on him, though. Like looked lively. I thought looks like more of an attacking midfielder. Came um, on foot and champ, didn't he? So, yeah, I thought, yeah, so yeah, another one really can't really judge too soon. But I don't know what's happened. I'm not like not an expert on um, the under twenty threes. Don't really keep up to date with it that much. I try to, but not always. But it just seemed he was on the bench for one game, wasn't he? And then he had his, and then they signed him to a professional contract, didn't they? And then he's he's had his debut on Saturday. So it's all been a really quick turnaround, unless it's something. You know, Martin has seen him and said, look, we want him in the squad. He looks good. I think, I can't remember who made the comment, but someone said he was like a leader in the under-23s. Um, so maybe just instantly likes him and then going back to Fulton. He's obviously made his mind up early about him. Maybe he's just looked at this player in the under-23s and just thought, this is definitely the type of player we want in this game some game time. Yeah, worth, worth chucking him on rather than Fulton if he, well, like Sally's made his mind up and he thinks, well, he's not the future. So why not give some minutes to some people that might have uh, an input in the future? And we do need a bit of flair and attack in the uh, play, you know, game more than what we have got. And I did see in his nine minutes, he did have a shot. It got blocked, but yeah. he had a shot, which yeah. I guess for your debut as an 18-year-old, why not? And they just try and imagine he smashed down the top corner in the 93rd minute. Yeah. All the away fans going nuts. That would have been another debut, wouldn't it? So, um, yeah, I think I can give the... Uh... Bit of better insight on him, I guess, because a uh, bit of a run joke. My mates mentioned it a few times, but I was I was in my year in school, so um, oh, I've exactly. played against him a couple of times actually. He's not fun oh, to nice. play against when you're playing in. There we are. Then we we'll get the so. scoop. <laughs> you know, you know, he's a nice lad. You know, he's he's good for yeah, evidently a great footballer. You know, playing in PE whatever, he'd always be on the best team. He'd be the best one on the team. You know, you yeah. didn't want to play if you weren't on his team. You know, he, you know, he's great football, and you could tell for his under twenty three performances as well. He's definitely going to be great, you know, 18 years of age as well. You know, come on, make your professional debut only after, what, his second game even being on the bench and he's already on the pitch. So that's got to say something about his ability, if nothing else. And even at his age, compared to some other players, you know, who are a bit older than him in the academy, that he's on the bench and they're still playing under 23 football. So I think it's a testament to his ability. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite exciting, really. Like a local lad as well. He must have just must have seen something already to chuck him straight in. Even if they brought him in to train with the first team, and they just thought like he's, he must have been that good in training. So I hope he gets uh, more game time between now and the end of the season. And I keep, I just keep forgetting again. Like we, I don't know if we were on the podcast at the time. Actually, if it was before we started, how young the squad is. So you've got this eighteen-year-old coming in now, and then I forgot. Then you've got players like Brandon Cooper coming back and Ollie Cooper. You got all these young players coming. They got if they can stick largely with this group of players that they've got. For three or four years, they could be some force if it yeah. all goes the plan. And you got like yeah. uh, that Ben Lloyd as well. He made he played earlier yeah. in the season. And he was seventeen. You know, he's even yeah. younger. Dan so, Williams you know, as well. We've got a really good youth foundation. I think mixed with you know you've got experience heads like you know you got Smith. You got you know it's mad though. You got people like Matt Grimes. The age of, was he 26, 27 and he's yeah. one of the more experienced players in the team. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Um, well, I hope it goes well for Cameron. It's quite nice to see a little a player come in midfield from our academy because we don't think there's been too many. I know we've had like Dan Williams and stuff, but too many that have come in and actually managed to break through properly, get in uh, the game properly. You know, even attackers like Cullen been in and out, but he's gone on loan. We had Garrick come in and out, and then he went on loan. Connor Roberts, Cabango, well, Rodon, back, so. they are the main ones that came through recently. So it'd be nice to have someone further up the pitch. Let's hope that he can make a good yeah. impact and uh, stick around and, and have some positives going forward. Um, sticking on the youth uh, trend, Kyle Joseph uh, played in that game you mentioned earlier, as well as Ogbeta and I'm sure a couple of others, but a notable performance from Kyle Joseph. Obviously, he got recalled uh, in January from his loan spell whilst Morgan Whitaker and Liam Cullen went went out on loan so he kind of came back to be the cover striker as those two left who were kind of doing that role between them um and he scored four goals in the under 23s so he's, he's got something about him as well i know we brought him in and he's not necessarily one of our academy products but um you know he's getting some minutes off the bench 
he had an unfortunate run out against Fulham where he was kind of just out there to run around. But uh, I would like, I wonder when he's going to get his first start in the first team, like in the league, and to see what he can actually offer. Because I feel like every time he comes on at the moment, he kind of sees the game out more than yeah. is there to try and actually change the game. I think wing back could be a place. We seem to be doing that a lot with strikers moving a bit further back on their wing backs. Yeah, they play. Well, he did you know, play there in a game uh, against Plymouth earlier in the season on the right. Yeah. It's because you know they, you know, I think the Cheltenham fans said you know we're not necessarily the best footballing ability up front, but his worth work ethic is unrivaled apparently. You know, and yeah. that's really a large aspect of playing on the wing back positions. You've just got to be working and working and running down that wing up and down all the time. So I think. Yeah, you know we have a habit of doing that with strikers. I think uh, Cullen was rumored to even be going there at some point. So maybe he could be a right wing back as his first start. Well, I um, I actually made a point of saying after the Plymouth game when Morgan Whitaker scored a hat trick, he was getting all applauded. But for me, Kyle Joseph had a far better game than Morgan Whitaker in that game, and he was playing wing back. He looked far more lively on the ball, far more dangerous. Took a lot more players on than Whitaker. Whitaker just happened to be in those positions where he scored the goals and credit to him for, for the finishes. But his overall performance that day wasn't as good as Kyle Joseph's uh, input on the game, I thought, anyway. So, yeah, I I could see him offering something in wing back. I guess at championship level, you just have to make sure that he can do the defensive part enough before you, you put him there, I guess. But I'm sure he's come on, actually as a sub once or twice in the league there, but I guess only in like the 80th yeah. minute or something. Yeah, so yeah. It's come on a you couple of times, yeah. too much. But um, yeah, one for the future. Well, I do wonder if like Perot or Buffemi or even both got injured. Um, you know, how would we fare with him perhaps starting and and if he went to be a main striker? It'd be, it, it could be one of those hits of ground running or he could be one that doesn't score a goal. So it'd be interesting to, to see what he can offer perhaps. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think, yeah, if you're trying to mould him into a wing back, I think it makes sense because, um, you see, when he plays the wing back, sometimes they're like up with the striker, aren't they? Like it's almost a three up top with the wing backs with how far they get forward. Um, so I think if you've got a wing back with a bit of end product as well, which he's got, I think that could be dangerous if they're trying to mould him into that. I think that would be good because I can't, yeah. I, to be honest, I can't, I just can't see him getting game time up top with Obafemi and Perot there. You've got Cullen and Whitaker to come back as well. Whether they stay or not, I'm not sure, but and I don't know. It just seems and Garrick, yeah, Garrick to come back as well. God, so it's quite. There's a, there's, there's loads of players to come back. He'll have a big. He'll have a lot of decisions to make in the preseason when he, there's just so many players to come back. Whether he gets yeah. another loan spell, maybe I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, because we couldn't resend really him out alone. I think his game time was the issue at Cheltenham. I don't think he was playing a lot, or yeah. as much as agreed anyway. And obviously. With the COVID rule no longer enforced, well, 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 yeah, you can't use it anymore. You couldn't, you can't go to more than two clubs in one season. So, because no. he'd already made an appearance for us, and then you know he's played for Cheltenham, he can't actually go anywhere else. So I think that's yeah. probably a reason why he didn't go again. But obviously, you know, he said if Perot or Aubameyang did get injured, I suppose he's there for that backup just in case something would happen. Yeah. Well, we needed one one of them. I'm guessing the fact that they knew. They had Lincoln lining up the other two. It was easy to recall him and use him instead. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're all probably on quite similar levels, I'd imagine. Cullen has scored the most out of all of them, I think, for us. Um, and that only being what, four goals. <laughs> uh, he had a couple, didn't he, last season? A couple in the cup against Forest, didn't he? Yeah. yeah, I'm sure he had a couple win. in the league as well. Those sub, sub, yeah, he got one against Wickham as well. Yeah, he did, yeah. But yeah, I'm not really sure which one. Perhaps it might be the one that, say there's three of them going for one position. I wonder which one would uh, come through. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, that's uh, most of the talking points. Just quickly touch on the next game then. So we're going away to Peterborough United. Um, I did say earlier on their form has been quite poor, but they've actually, it looks like they've actually worked hard in the last two games they've had to get some form of result, which whether it ends up being enough for them, I'm not sure. But the last two results have been draws, and there was a away at Bournemouth where they, they drew one all, and home to Stoke City where they, they scored like a 93rd minute equaliser. Obviously, Stoke have been quite poor recently as well, so not a good result for them. And Bournemouth as well, like they, they tend to drop points here and there. 
Before that, they lost five on the bounce, but one of those was a 2 0 defeat to Man City. You know, our away form hasn't been great. How do we feel going into this one, P? A bit more confident because it's not Saturday at three o'clock. That's the we seem to we seem to pick up some good results in the week. Um, yeah, I think it's it's a bit of a dodgy one because we shouldn't be losing this game. We've said like how poor the bottom four are. We should be winning that game um, with the quality that we do have. But unfortunately, there is a blueprint to play against us at the moment. Like we saw Blackpool Saturday. I could just see Peterborough doing the same thing, being down the table. They're just going to dig in and they and sit back and let us have the ball. Um, but again, we've got to get used to that. So it'd be interesting to see how they overcome it because he spoke about we need to create more chances. So let's see what they can come up with. But um, yeah, we got to be winning that game. James, then, how do we go and win this game? Do we need to make any changes to our team? Um, I think, obviously, you know, after losing 1-0, it's likely you'll make changes, obviously, midweek as well. You've got to be rotating the team, making sure, you know, other players get game time. Obviously, you know, resting certain players. Because, you know, as much as we'd love to see Piro, Abafemi, Darren's Grimes play every game, they're not invincible. They're human. They're going to need breaks now and again. Uh, obviously Grimes a lot more important in the aspect he is the captain and he will probably play most games and most minutes of every game but uh, I think you know Peter Bryce, it really bottom of the league I know we don't have a great track record playing teams towards the bottom of the table because we get a bit complacent but uh, if we really need to be beating teams like Peter Bryce, just to show that this is a project worth waiting for I think because you know I think while yep. at home you know 3-0 played them off the park they didn't even have a look in our goal so you know, come into this game. I think maybe you can make a few changes. As you said, maybe try out the one striker thing, give one of them a rest, see if Perot works better by himself or Buffen works better by himself. But I wouldn't change too much from Blackpool. I think, as you said, you know, Martin's comments weren't necessarily wrong. You know, it's a decent performance of what he wants to see. Yeah. So if we could play like that against Peter Brown, sure, there'll be a lot more chances for your creativity, and they'll also have a lot less chances going forward to put us under more pressure. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, you said maybe some changes. I'm looking at the bench from the Blackpool game. What changes do you make? Yeah, that, that is the problem. Our squad depth is a bit hideous, I can't lie. <laughs> it yeah, is it bit, is. You know, you know, so I'll read said... the list out and then I, I yeah, we'll see if any of you say, yeah, we should bring him in, right? Ben Hamer, Finley Burns, Cameron Congreve, Jay Felton, Joel Lathbodia, Nathaniel looked better, Kyle Joseph, and obviously Ryan Bennett didn't make the squad. I think Finley Burns, I think I said this when obviously we saw Manning got the four game ban. I'm, I really think he should be given a chance at centre back and play it back in a five because, you know, yeah. hopefully uh, Wolf will be back next week or anyone that can play at wing back, even you if just reminded me. In. That's what I meant to mention as well. Hans Wolf is, they think, going to be fit for this game. Yeah, so you know, if you bring Wolf back in at left wing back, I think definitely give Burns a run at one of the centre back roles because I think he was very good in the times he's come off or played, started, whatever. He's been very impressive, you know, and we have the option there if we want him next season. So I think he's really got chances like this now with Manning on a full game ban to go yep. out there and show why he deserves to be re signed next season. And hopefully he can be as good as he has been because, you know, it's. One thing that he brings to the team as well, which we don't have a lot of, is height. You know, he, our tallest player is like Cabango, who's six one. Yeah. I think he's our tallest player. So, you know, with someone bringing, obviously, you know, we had the whole Reese Williams saga, which didn't exactly go to plan. But Burns has shown he is a lot better, I think, in the aspect of where he plays. And maybe, hopefully, you know, we got our first set goal, set piece goal all season uh, in the last week. So maybe Burns can be that threat from set pieces at six for six. Yeah, maybe. Interesting to see if Wolf comes back in. But do you know what? I'm actually like, he's done a good job of left wing back, but I just want to see more of him further off the pitch. Yeah. Like when he played, I can't remember what game it was. It was one of the first ones he played where he was on the left wing. It might have been, um, I can't remember who it was. I think we lost the game, but he did really well on the left. He was taking players on. He actually wanted to run at players. And he was beating them again in the box and crossing. He looked dangerous, and we don't see as much of that from his left wing back position. So I do wish we we saw a little bit more of him further up the pitch. I, I get why he's there, but it's a shame because I don't think he was intentionally or well, initially bought for left wing back. It just so happens that that's where he's ended up. Um, yeah. 
And yeah. I hope, you know, if Ogbeta's come in fit now and getting a little bit more up to speed, I don't want the fact that Hans Wolf uh, can play left wing back to stop him getting on the pitch. I'd rather have the left wing back on the pitch and have Hans Wolf as competition for Patterson or Cham in those kind of roles. So then they aren't necessarily always guaranteed to start, which may, maybe makes them play a little bit better. Otherwise, they get dropped and Wolf has a go. Like, you know, that's that's kind of what you want, isn't it? So Yeah. Uh, we always look at the um we just look at the bench and you think, oh, we need a change in this game. And then you look at the bench and you just think, oh, I don't know who's gonna come on and change this game. But with Ogbeta coming back from injury and Wolf coming back from injury. Um and we said about Pro and uh and Oberfair, there are a few there are like a few more options opening up to him now, like he's gone back to a four uh in the last couple of games, isn't he, at the back? So I'd be interested if he, you know, if I'll bet I'll bet is going to be fit. I don't think he will be for Wednesday because he played today, Denise. So I don't think he's going to start. But you might see, like you said, about Cham being better coming off the bench. If he plays him, you know, on the left and Patterson on the right or, or swap them and then bring in Cham off the bench, it'd be good to see what, that, uh, what that's like. It'd just be something different, wouldn't it? Just Keep Corey Wolf. Smith left yeah. back and put Wolf instead of Cham. That'd be nice. I wouldn't even be against that. As I said, you know, he's been great yeah. at left. I think he's been great at fullback. So I, I would I'd not take be against him starting there. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see what Russell Mann does for this one. Wednesday evening, uh, the Peterborough game. I don't know if this one's on the red button. hope so. Yeah, it is. Yeah, after we've moved yeah. the bus guy. <laughs> yeah, good, because I'm sick of not being able to watch the games Trent legally. Stream somewhere. Well, it doesn't really work, does it? It's hard these days to find a lot of them, but legally, you should be able yeah. to watch the game. I agree. You shouldn't have to go to these... Especially like, obviously, I guess the whole Saturday, three PM, no, but midweek seven forty five, especially in Peterborough, I mean, that's a trek as it is on a Saturday. Yeah, oh, yeah. Fans, let yeah. alone a bloody Wednesday night. So yeah, I think yeah. midweek game should really be put on the red button. Well, we had a rant about this in the last uh, podcast. I uploaded the clip separately, so if anyone wants to see our um sort of rant or uh, opinions on Sky's coverage of British football and the direction it's going and the changes we feel need to come. I think I think the way that football is broadcast and sort of the content, I think football needs to be, instead of being considered of a, a TV broadcast, it needs to be now considered as content because that's the way the world is these days. Like Netflix is content now, it's not TV. It's more content. You choose where you want to watch, when you want to watch it. Obviously, it's live, so you're not going to choose necessarily when unless you're watching it on catch-up. But the way that you just maybe go on to some sort of like app and pick the game you want, whatever fee you pay, and maybe there's different levels of subscription, it just needs to get modernized to like modern ways of how people consume things. And it's just an old-fashioned system that's just is not working, I don't think, in this country. Like, why why should you be able to watch these games abroad? Like it just makes no sense. But you can't watch half of them in your own country. Like it doesn't matter what team you support. I think everyone should be on the same uh, agenda here. But us guy, they're gonna keep control and keep doing what they want to do until the money is at risk or there's another competition offering more or whatever the keep putting situation a is. Bournemouth versus Middlesbrough at twelve o'clock on a Sunday. Yeah. I was thinking that the other day because we said we mourned about this the sky coverage and said that I saw they, they they might argue that less people will go to the games if it's on TV, but then they pick a game for TV. I remember one of them was Cardiff Middlesbrough at was twelve, so Middlesbrough yeah, going to get they Cardiff. Put Bournemouth versus Middlesbrough, which is the longest journey for yeah. any football team in the whole season, on at twelve o'clock, and there's Bournemouth fans having to leave at like three in the morning just to make yeah, kickoffs. Like, not even so you, early. You're guaranteed then by putting that game on TV at was twelve. You're guaranteed that less fans are going to go. So yeah. It's kind of counterproductive to what That's they're trying to do. Yeah. I suppose that is the point, though, because then you get more people subscribing to their subscription services because they simply won't yeah. wake up at three in the morning to go travel stupid amounts of miles in a day to but go then, watch their team. But then they argue the point of not showing any three o'clock ones is to keep fans going to the game. So, yeah, it's very contradictory in certain aspects it's, like that. You know, yeah, it's it's I know ridiculous. It's midweek games are going to fall, but Swans Peterborough on Wednesday was that probably avoidable? You know, it's quite a far one, isn't it? Peterborough, it's literally on the hours. east coast. It's as, it's as far as Norwich, really. It's yeah, not yeah it's a Norwich. hell of a track, Peterborough. Is. And you think how you know how far Norwich is for a 
normal Saturday, three o'clock, that's still waking up relatively early for Swans fans. Yeah. So you think how, how late they're going to be home from that Peterborough yeah. game? You know, they're not going to be. It's surprising, really. Weekend. Like you should be. You'd imagine they'd think about. And I saw I saw people calling this out. I know we've gone off topic again here, but like the environmental aspect, the environment and um, all that sort of stuff is a massive topic these days. Uh, global warming, reducing your targets, you know, being more sustainable, all the rest of it. I know you are going into detail on that, but like Sky as a company, by putting the games at these times. Well, I mean, the game's at a time, isn't it? And Sky move it for TV, so the game is now a different time. So, like, just from, like, public transport perspective, these these times make it so... Like, you can't get a train to Peterborough, like, Wednesday night and get That's home on the same problem. night. Listen, public I, I live, transport. I live close, to obviously. I don't have the benefit of going on the coach. Like, at the Swansea defense, 30 quid. It costs me yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. You know, I spent... I think it was ninety pound alone on the train just to get to Preston, and yeah. So aside you know, from there's the no costs, trains, I can't simply do midweek games because you know no driving. Yeah, uh, yeah, you look at like how far Peterborough is, and getting a train home at ten o'clock at night to be back at the time is impossible midweek. You'd have to stay over. But then encouraging yeah. like all the fans to drive. I know there's buses that are put on, but it's not everyone's going on the bus. You are reducing the options. There's no like public buses, you know, like or. Or um, trains or anything like that, like or even if I know a long shot, but there are some games you might travel to by plane. Like when we were in the Premier League, you might have gone to Newcastle on the plane. Yeah. Um, but the timing of this game just reduces your options. And just from that perspective as well, I just think Sky should do better. Um, it should be like, you know, they, they didn't put Cardiff Swans on the TV. Why? Why don't they make yeah. Cardiff Swans a midweek game, even in? Because oh, that'd be good. it's literally Friday up the night road. Be good. It's that's, literally that, up the road. Everyone can get a train up there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. organize, organize one train with National Rail where this is designated for the football fans. I don't know. Just as a, something that I mean, they could the do. Coaches anyway, but everyone has yeah, to go on them anyway. Yeah. So bubble yeah. coaches, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't even have oh, that'd be, that'd be class there. if they did. If they did a midweek one, I'd fancy that just for a change. Friday night against Cardiff. Oh, Friday, Friday, Friday night. But like everyone's own by like. Up uh, past 10, 11 o'clock, do you know what I mean? Like a, yeah. a midweek yeah. game and you're up by 11. Like, come on, that, that would, mm. that's what they need to do. Yeah. The close yeah, rivalries, they should be midweeks. Especially, like, we usually I said, it's, it's hard to get trains home from these certain places. Like, there's no chance in hell you're travelling to people on the train unless you do it two separate days. You know, yeah. you'd be sitting in a train station at 3 a.m. waiting for it to yeah. open. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so well, they, don't, they, don't, they don't really think of it that well, do they? They, no. they could definitely plan it better. No, they don't give a crap about the fans. They're just like, well, if you look at it, anything comes across. They're like, well, what? Where's this team in the table? Where's this team in the table? How many times we showed this team? How many times we showed this team? Who's going to bring in the most money? That's the things they consider. Well, or consider, are they West Brom? And if so, yes, put them on TV every single game <laughs> yeah. they play. Yeah, but they're <laughs> yeah. supposed to have oh, a quota, aren't they? Like, you're only supposed, yeah, no, to, supposed have to have a certain have against, amount. Games, right? Haven't they been broadcast like 30 times? Yeah, probably. But then when you think about it, like Birmingham's the second biggest um, uh, city in the UK. Yeah. So by showing West Brom, they're probably catching a lot more people watching yeah, Sky. True. That's the, probably the point behind it. Like, when Leeds were down here, they used to be on TV all the time, just because Leeds oh. historically have got a big following. Leeds are constantly on TV. So it's, that's that's what I mean. That's what they consider these things. They're like, like, they're in it for themselves, basically, and they're not giving any crap about any of the fans. Anyway, we, we had a rant of all this in the last to be, podcast. To be fair, so... though, I will say, like you said, though, like <laughs> if you think we got Birmingham home on Saturday... That could have been midweek, couldn't it's it? Flip them round. I mean, I like yeah, it that... when the Midlands games are on a Saturday because it's not far to travel, to be fair. It's quite good. Like, Commonry bought a massive following down, didn't they? Because it's a nice trip for a Saturday, three o'clock. But then, realistically, we've got to go to Peterborough on a Wednesday night. And then, you know, we've got Birmingham on Saturday. Like, they could Should have... Should be the other way could... around. Yeah. Yeah, they could have yeah. done that the other way around. Yeah. Well, yeah, there we go. I'm sure, again, that topic's going to keep coming up, I'm sure. <laughs> but... Thank you very much today, James, for joining us. No, thank you very much for having me. Would you like to remind everybody where they can find you on Twitter and, and any of your work? Yeah, so my out on Twitter is James SCFC underscore. And then, as I said on my pin tweet, literally the first tweet that's on my profile, it's a link to one of my articles, and then that'll take you to my website. You can look at anything I've done so far. So go give him a follow on Twitter. You can also give us a follow on Twitter as well. Just type in Swans Cast. I'm sure you'll find us. Um, and Lee, thanks for joining as well. No worries. 
Don't forget to subscribe. Help us grow to reach that target of 500. There's 50% of you or more that aren't subscribed. So click that button. Help us out there. And uh, we shall see you in the next video. So thank you very much and see you later. See you soon.